I would like to disclaim the fact that uh, just about everything I said could be absolute crap. Um, you know, just want to say I am I am not here. I'm not an expert. I am here to just participate in the conversation. But yeah, um, absolutely, bro. I would not take anything I said to the bank at None all. None of us yeah. are experts. None yeah. of us are experts. We're <laughs> just, this stuff's fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> it is most, fascinating. It mostly gets talked about by experts. So yeah. we just wanted to kind of jump in and. And start to sift through it because yeah. there's so much cool stuff here that there is. Oh, I don't. Know. It's all I've always been fascinated. Yeah, the only thing I know is I don't know, but I yeah. am fascinated yeah. too, man. Yeah, yeah. that is like, what I'm positive ocean, on. Bro. I think we're recording. Hello, and welcome to a very special episode of Meta Bros. It's more of a Meta family tonight. We've got several family members here, and we're just going to hang out and talk about fun topics that we would normally talk about, but share them with you. Uh, so, with that out of the way. Bro, why don't you introduce the topic? It's on the screen. Those at home can hopefully see it in the lower left-hand corner as well as you guys in the room. Yeah, sure. So uh, we decided to just kind of hop into something that we've been fascinated by, uh, the pyramids and Egypt in general, just because it's such a mysterious land of, you know, these incredible stone structures. And we'll get into some of the precision involved in these things. And just kind of the question of like, sort of how did they build this? And also the fact that like the, the theories that we have right now, the scientific theories for how they built this thing aren't really realistic, like in terms of the manpower and how many people supposedly were involved in the projects. And there's a lot of debating theories, but I think it's just fascinating because it's this part of our history where we did something that is so incredible and <laughs> we yeah. don't exactly know how we did it. So I guess we're here to talk about what we don't know about the pyramids in a way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's just it's such a fascinating topic. Like one of the first things that it was small, but it kind of blew my mind was that the pyramid, I always thought it was four sides and it's actually eight sides. And that in itself, I thought was interesting. And this was actually discovered in an aerial flight. It's not talked about much. Um, despite what you may think about this ancient structure, the Great Pyramid is an eight-sided figure, not a four-sided figure. Each of the pyramid's four sides are evenly split from the base to the tip by a very subtle concave indentation. It is believed that this discovery was made in 1940 by British Air Force pilot uh, named P. I thought we had his full name there. But uh, yeah, so... Why? Like, why that level of precision? They're already huge blocks. It's a big structure. It's apparently a long time ago when this was very challenging to do. And yet, let's put this perfect little line. And is that a handful distance. of them or is that all of them for the most part? Uh, that is the Great Pyramid itself. Okay. Yes. Are, do the other pyramids mirror that design? <clears throat> I don't believe. No. no, I think it's just the Great Pyramid that does yeah, that. Yeah, just the know. Great Pyramid. So I would suggest two reasons why that could be the case. Um, and, and I think we should probably get more into the actual construction of the pyramids. But if, if, uh, the great pyramid was originally capped, as far as I know, with a pointed peak of gold that could be seen at a, a really far distance. And then down from that right now, I mean, the, the pyramids are pretty much in a state of outer decay and crumbling. You know, the outside walls of the pyramids uh, are not smooth the way they were originally constructed. Originally, very smooth stones capping the outside of the pyramids. A lot of those have fallen apart, and there are still a few areas of the pyramid where you can see it. Is that the capstone? No, that is not the capstone. So although okay. it is believed, you're right, uh, by uh, Egypt historians, mm -hmm. Egyptologists, that there was a capstone. We never found it. However, I just want to bring up that we do have these pieces of very large granite that have precision carvings mm -hmm. that we'd be hard pressed to do today without using some type of diamond tipped and laser cutting for the symmetry. Yeah, I actually I read that we actually have one of these that is made out of a material that is only found in meteorites. And the material itself is so hard that we can't even laser cut it these days. Like it, it just, we're, we have no idea how they exacted a level of precision cutting into something that was that hard uh, right. that long ago. Anyway, um, the cap in gold and then smooth outer face from top to bottom, which has now, you know, deteriorated over time. Well, would it be realistic to say that 
it was actually constructed in a way to to manage um, like uh, sandstorms or dust storms in that area, you know, to channel that material so it didn't lay on the outside of the pyramid, but instead ran off in channels. Uh, that's possible, right? Maybe. I mean, well, they I don't get a lot of see, rain yeah, out there, yeah. as I was originally going to say a storm, but of course it's in the middle of one of the largest deserts on Earth, so... <laughs> I don't know if I don't know if uh, the they get a lot of storms out there. It used to be a jungle. Yeah, long I was going to say ago. the environment. Right now, that's true. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. And yeah. We, was uh, it a jungle when the pyramids were built? That's a good question. So the modern historical explanation for the pyramids, just so we establish that first, is that I'll just grab this and pull this over. So all three. This is common knowledge all three of giza's famed pyramids and their elaborate burial complexes were built during a frenetic period of construction from roughly 2550 to 2490 bc the pyramids were built by pharaohs khufu tallest khafri the background and menkure the front um, so built by three different pharaohs the great pyramid would be the one who apparently i believe it's, it's khufu yeah. yes who built it mm -hmm. um However, we don't really know. And right. there are no hieroglyphics on the Great Pyramids. And it's interesting that the older the construction, the larger the blocks, the more sophisticated or precision the cuts mm -hmm. of the blocks. Mm -hmm. And there aren't any logos or graffiti uh, or just markings, I should say. So we <clears throat> denote the largest pyramid, the Great Pyramid to Khufu, because of this. This was painted on one of the blocks. And when we found the, in modern times, when we found the Great Pyramid, because that says Khufu, that's his cartouche, I believe it's called, mm -hmm. we just said, okay, this is the, maybe he built it. Mm -hmm. And also, they do take credit historically, these pharaohs. So they say they built them in 20 years. Now, when they built them, supposedly, they looked more like this. Yeah. Because they were covered in limestone. So there are three different phases to these pyramids. That's pretty interesting. It's the block structure, and you can see it here pretty well. You have these base blocks in the center, and they're very large. And then you actually have these capstone blocks. Uh, is that what they're called, capstone blocks? I think the covering. capstone is the actual piece at the very... I may very... be using the wrong terminology, but there's like a covering Like a stone. fascia on the outside. Yeah. Right? But they're just as big, but they're just smooth. And that's what we see uh, when we go to images like this, we see this right here. So these are just as big, right. these blocks, but they're just perfectly smooth. Mm. And the way that they fit together, it's it's perfect, like every single one, but they're not uniform. They're just fitted back together without any room in between some of these. Mm. Um, and then finally, there was a layer of supposed uh, a casing stone that was all limestone, hmm. so it would be shining. But limestone does deteriorate. It's it's so easier just, to carve. Like yeah, a lot of the, yeah. a lot of the uh, the Native American uh, villages that were carved into cliff sides. <laughs> that, if I'm not mistaken, that was limestone that they carved into because they could actually carve out rooms and windows and doors and make villages in a in a cliff side. That makes sense. You know, those yeah. exist. I think down in. Uh, Arizona. I know that that's you, a lot of sandstone. Too. Yeah. But oh, sandstone. Similar. Sandstone soft, as well. Soft right. Stone. Softer. Stuff that carvable. was compressed that breaks apart easily. I think Which that's is why that. maybe the exterior looks the way it does now. Yeah. You know. Yeah. They. I don't know if they. That's a good question to ask. Did they find limestone or white uh, Great Pyramid? Just I don't know what I'm saying, right? Uh, was the Great Pyramid covered in white limestone? Around 5.5 million tons of limestone. 8,000 tons of granite transported from Aswan, uh, 800 kilometers away, so like 500 miles, and 500,000 tons of mortar were used to build the Great Pyramid. This mighty stone formed part of an outer layer of fine white limestone that would have made the sides completely smooth. Here's the thing, and I find this fascinating. We have tried to move some uh, of the blocks. Now, not the ones that are actually on the pyramid, but we've tried to move blocks of the same material and same size using every single modern technique that we have. We don't even own machinery on the planet Earth that can move some of these blocks. And we do now. 
We do. Go do you ahead. mind if I step in here? So Please. I wanted to look up some of this stuff just for fun. So uh, the heaviest object ever lifted on land. This is as, as of October 17th, 2022. I don't know if that's when the record was set. Let's look at the Guinness Book. But it's it's 23,178 tons. Now it's with, lifted with what? It, lifted? This platform was lifted 6.5 meters or 86.9 feet at the shipyard of Hunandai Heavy Industries in Olsen, South Korea. So it's with a crane. It's one of one of these fucking mega cranes that are insane. One of the ones that's like a box and it. Yeah, but that's something that's also like rooted. Like it's at like. And it's modern. It's at a dock and it's right. rooted like into like it's the part, deep it's like, ocean it's, it's definitely part of something part like of i'm wondering if it's like a dry dock crane you know oh i'm not showing like you guys that. the image i apologize no. i'm looking at my thing so i think this is what it was the platform oh no that's the platform that was lifted so what lifted the whole undy heavy industries a goliath crane that's what they're saying a goliath so here we go so we didn't have that in Egypt, as far as we know. That's also, you know, that's <laughs> it didn't not... didn't move it 500 miles. So. Right, it didn't. It lifted at 86 feet. But these blocks in Egypt, the biggest ones in the Great Pyramid, are only 80 tons. And this thing had 23,176 tons. Yeah. So okay. it stomped us. All right. And now, yeah, just definitely. to play, you know, both sides but of this... But the blocks were moved hundreds of miles from their original so location. With, with that yeah. in mind, on record, the largest stone that we know that was moved is this thunderstone. And I believe that this is in Russia. And this stone weighs 1,500 tons. And when they actually went to get it, it weighed 2,000 tons. And as they hauled this thing, they chipped this thing into the shape they wanted. So it started as 2,000, and then it ended up 1,500. And now it sits in Russia as their main centerpiece. How far did they move this thing? But Man, you got to be... 150 meters a day is what they said. Where did it come from and where did it end? <laughs> the heaviest stone moved by man starting out at 2,000 tons and was carved down to 1,500 while being moved, now down to 1,250 tons as it serves as the pedestal for the statue of Peter the Great called the Bronze Horseman. Pulled from the marshy ground in 1768 by Russian workers under the command of a Greek lieutenant, colonel in the Russian army moved the stone 150 meters a day. It took nearly nine months to move the massive stone six kilometers to the Gulf of Finland. So they okay. moved it about five miles. And it took them nine months. Mm -hmm. And we were supposed to move, hold on, this is great. Yeah, Sorry, they chiseled it down and they Imagine, moved imagine it. you're thinking that you're going on like this important mission and then your commander is just like, I like that boulder, get that for me. Yeah. Right, what made that one so special? And you're like, uh, <laughs> okay, I'm going to need uh, hundreds of men and nine months. Like, and we're going to move it five miles. Yeah, so, yeah and that's you know. it. We, and we can take it What's from the math there to on there. That? <laughs> how, how far did they move it every day? 150 meters. 150 meters every day. day. So this is what they did to move it 150 meters every day. These what are, is that to feet? So like two football fields, not even. Uh, let's see, 150 That's a hard meters. Work, man. To you look up at that big rock. So every 500 morning, feet a day you have to get at one more football field. Yeah. With pulls, <laughs> humans, uh, pullers. I mean. Uh, I All right, know. now wait a minute. So tracks. In the case, <laughs> there's been there's been a lot of speculation that the Great Pyramids, that the Egyptians in general had technology that we don't understand today. Uh, you know, technology and an, an understanding of, of matter that has been lost over time. They were able, you know, some people say they were able to levitate these stones and move them. Some people say that uh, aliens were involved to move these stones and with, you know, using otherworldly technology that we don't have. I mean, who knows? When the Library of Alexandria burned to the ground, we probably lost a whole lot of knowledge, oh, you know, yeah. that, that might have explained how this was done. Um, it could be as fantastical as your mind could possibly invent. It could be so simple that it's just like, hey, look, you know, it's when you've got a bunch of police when you got you know six thousand slaves just pulling like on ropes, police. you can move an eighty ton block a couple right. you know over but rolling now, logs. It's mm -hmm. not just that they moved it five hundred miles, uh, like these eighty ton blocks. Mm -hmm. Those are the biggest, um, not the largest in history, but at this site in Giza, it's not just that they moved as far as I know these eighty ton blocks five hundred miles. 
Um, they also cut them with such precision, yeah, which is challenging because they were supposed to have copper tools. And our best guess is that they were using some type of like solution, like a, a sand or some type of solution with grit in it, like a solvent. So I have something. an answer to this. Yeah. Uh, let me an say one more. Let me say okay. one more thing. Yep, go ahead. Because I want to throw this out. Um, just a couple fun facts that how many blocks? How many blocks? Let's see. How many blocks does the Great Pyramid have? All right, so, right. Oh, Holy. So 20 years. Did you move that many blocks? Over 2 million? That's insane. Is that what I'm saying? 2.3 yeah. million. And the average is 2.5 tons. So did you figure out your system that tight that you could do 500 miles from cutting them out, coring them, transporting them, and then putting them there perfectly so you're not even fitting anything in between them? In 20 years. Yeah. There had to so, be some kind of... And you're of working in an environment of sand. So... And you got you copper tools. That too. What is it? You're so working with sugar million? sand. At least we uh, don't know. 2,300,000. Okay, 2,300,000. So let's say... The average so being 2.5 tons. 20 years. So... Yeah, so 20 times 365. So 7,300 days. Okay. 23... 2,300,000... 2, blocks divided by 7,800 days. I mean, you're talking about 300 blocks a day. That's crazy. You know, 294 blocks needed to get cut and laid a day. To There's get it no done way. In 20 years. You yeah. could you could get every like major power in the world to I feel like collectively try to move that many blocks in a day. It's right. still and like let's, say, wouldn't let's happen. say they exaggerated. It, it, like, like, Put hum like risk humanity. So on here's it, a, it wouldn't go ahead, bro, let's say let's you. say they exaggerated and it wasn't actually twenty years and it like took took like fifty years. You know, okay. So let's say it's still crazy. Three sixty five yeah. times fifty. Okay, eighteen thousand two fifty. Five hundred so miles. We take two million. Talking about a day. You don't move something five hundred miles in a day. Divided by eighteen thousand two fifty. That doesn't happen. That's one hundred twenty six blocks a day you so know like that still right. impossible unless you're flying you know? it <clears throat> so and we're trying we're trying to talk about like pulleys like you know rollers yeah like yeah, maybe yeah levers the you know stuff like that is 500 now miles i did a see day. i did right. see and it talking one about point. something right. that heavy and or, right. or even like, how about building uh, tracks and filling it with water like walls and trying to float it and building an artificial i'm just making yeah. shit up just trying to that, so like one of the one of the theories that I like is that At that point, I think Khufu, the stones are so heavy that they'll just sink. I know. Well, yeah, I don't yeah, know. I'll have to look that up. So, mm -hmm. like, one of the theories see. that I, I like is that Khufu sure just uh, Khufu just repaired the pyramid. Khufu didn't sand actually build stone. the pyramid. Uh, um, that's a theory, is that the pyramid was already a structure, and he worked on it maybe for 20 years mm -hmm. and restored it to a point or did work on it but didn't actually build the thing from scratch. So are we assigning the age of the Great Pyramid based upon the fact that we think Khufu did it? Partially that and Khufu partially that because we found artist. some bones in the area. But bones aren't a date for stone. You no. Know, that just means that somebody was there. and uh, We've never found a mummy... Nope. Or any type of person in the actual. So great nothing pyramid. you can carbon. Date. What is in nothing the great pyramid? Date. Nothing that had organic origins. There is nothing what they call like a sarcophagus. The area. But um, here's the thing. Actually, I'll pull this screen up real quick. This is going to make it easier. So, oh, we'll get into that in a second. Uh, so this is in the grand gallery of. I, is, no, it's not called the grand gallery. I believe it's called the queen's chamber. I'll make sure I know what I'm talking about. I'll look this up. But this is in one of the main rooms of the Great Pyramid. And they called this a sarcophagus. But if you look at like what this shape is, what we find pharaohs in are these things that look like uh, this, you yeah, know? Like caskets. Yeah. Just like Glorified caskets. caskets. Yeah. And they fit perfectly around them. And yeah. these things are uh, giant. Like, look at some of these. Like, this... This, yeah, this, this is, is what is they the call Serapeum. sarcophagus. They never found a mummy in here. What they found in there was they found something called bitumen, and they found a bunch of, like, basically, like, leftover black muck from animals and uh, what would even be considered, they said, maybe dung. Um, there are, without going into that too deeply, there are no reason to believe that these things held people. Unless, I mean, you think about it, didn't old royalty get buried with their pets? Hmm. That's also true. Yeah. Maybe and they like idolize melted like, down. They to idolize some like cats and stuff, right? I won't say. Yeah, I can't argue that totally. So, but we just never found a mummy or like someone right. encased with like gold and like. Well, stuff. I mean, so, like 
With so that got, kind of technology, you can't here. imagine that something supernatural isn't going on and that something supernatural didn't right. happen in those bodies. If you look at it, it looks like they were either broken or they were given a place to wedge their hand in there so they could get out. So Every fun, single one of them has a wedge in them. Fun fact about these things, specifically these big ones, these are at a place called the Serapium, which is uh, considered to be like a necropolis for these bull things because, like he said, bull, bull parts... Uh, have been identified inside of those giant sarcophagi. But those giant sarcophagi are made of, like, an extremely hard granite. Mm -hmm. uh, and an engineer was so fascinated by them that he started taking measurements on those things. And they have straight edges within 0. 0.0003, like, uh, degrees of exact. Like a like thousand. Look at that. They're we're perfect. Talking... And they're all one piece. They weren't put together. It's all one unit. And the lid itself was cut from the same block and everything lines up without any space. And then what's weird is we have very crappy hieroglyphics on the outside taking credit for these. Mm. <laughs> Almost so, like somebody was like, I know. Un right. Unlike so, that capstone that has that beautiful precision that's also symmetrical, we've got these terrible hieroglyphics like the Khufu thing basically saying, I did this, this is mine. Mm -hmm. yeah. There is a, uh, so Graffiti artist. I got to hike yeah. to Machu Picchu. Oh, yeah. Yeah, bro. Okay. That's right. Yeah. And the like Khufu built it, I guess. Nobody knows. <laughs> in hiking to Machu Picchu, I remember one of the things that was really stood out for me. And we had we had an incredible guide when I was there. He really talked about the culture and how things happened. Um, we stood next to a wall that was at the top of Machu Picchu, uh, up where the basically the temple is. And this wall was maybe eight feet high, and it was made of um, it was made of eight rows of blocks. So there were two here uh, and then two more and two more at the top. The two bottom rows, all the blocks were completely flat. And I mean, they were so tight and so perfect that you could not slide a piece of paper in the groove. Mm. They were that perfect. And you're talking about blocks that are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years old. Then the blocks above had beveled corners around the block. So the bottom two rows, completely flat. The two rows above that, all the blocks, once again, super tight, unbelievable how they fit together, but they had beveled corners. And then the blocks at the top had no bevels, beveled corners, but just had a slight rounding to the outer wow. face. But once again, everything fit together really tight. And our guide asked us, can anyone tell me why the two bottom rows are flat, the two middle rows are beveled, and the two top rows are not beveled and have have a rounding to them. And we shot around a bunch of different ideas. He said, no, here's the reason why. He said, this eight foot high wall that was maybe 10 foot wide took three generations of architects to build. One man was responsible for the bottom of the wall and he spent his entire lifetime building the bottom two rows. And then after that, it was handed off to the next architect and he decided he wanted to bevel the edges and that was another man's entire life. And at the top, this eight foot high, 10 foot wide wall, that was your third architect up there. <laughs> and the Peruvians, the Quechuan people in the Inca empire that lived there, they didn't have anything harder than granite. That was it. Mm. So how did they shape these blocks? Well, one man would be given one block and his journey for his entire life was to shape that one block. He would spend his entire lifetime doing it. The Quechuan people, the Inca people in general, were very concerned with future generations. And there's so much in their culture and how they built their cities and everything else that speaks to that. But they would, uh, they would spend their entire life shaping a block by rubbing one piece of granite against another, and they would both wear at exactly the same rate until finally he wore the one he was rubbing down to a nub and he'd throw it away and get another one and then he'd rub that one. And he'd spend his entire lifetime just rubbing a block and making it the exact perfect shape. So when you take a look at blocks that are fit super tightly together and you picture one stonemason whose entire job, his entire life is spent just shaping that one block to be absolutely perfect, that's how they get like that. At least that's how they did for the Peruvians. But the Peruvians yeah, did something different. Do. When they built Machu Picchu, they that chose a mountaintop that was covered in rocks and they shaped those rocks and then rolled them downhill to the place where they were going to set them up and build stuff with them. At the most, they only had to lift them, you know, a couple of meters and their blocks weren't, you know, two, three dozens of tons. They, you know, they didn't have blocks that big. 
do you happen to know what wall it was? Was it one of the Inca walls at Sas Sasuke Huaman? That's so hard <laughs> Sas- for me to say. Sasuke Huaman. Sasuke Huaman. Yeah, yeah. Woman. Uh, so that is actually um, a neighboring mountain. That is not. Okay. That is not. So Machu this was Picchu actually a Machu Picchu stone wall. It was. It was, and it was. Um, there were a number of stone walls where they they shaped the stone with the like the inside of a cave or you know a cliff that you know was there and they shaped their their granite rocks right up against it so it all fit like a puzzle it was unbelievable to see some of the yeah it's the like, work that I, was there i see these blocks and it's like i why, actually have why a, make a it picture so of hard it like why make yeah. it so hard it almost looked hmm man but here's the thing the and what's fascinating and what to me nubs? is nub 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 yep, nub, I, I, nub nub it almost looks like t- to me and i don't know anything but it looks like it was wet and it was poured into like a mold and then that was the wet spot where they like pulled right. the bag off right yeah and it was like and it went and like, but it's all solid granite I know, and I know that's not a geopolymer, as far as we know. To that, like grinding the granite thing, I wonder if they took stones and tried to find ones that were as closely shaped as possible, and then just ground them with each other until they fit like maybe. Damn, it's so. It's like, why would you make it like? I almost understand this. Okay, that kind of makes sense to me. Although that's impressive, Mm -hmm. but I don't understand the moment you do this, where I'm like, hold on, this little edge right here. Why did you do that? Why did you make it? It's a little... So the theory is that the reason why these structures are built this way is because they can withstand earthquakes. Uh, the advanced geometry of the blocks means that when an earthquake shakes it, the blocks just resettle into each other mm. and they don't shake like apart. Like puzzle pieces. How That's did they cool. know that? That's what I'm saying. Like yeah. we can, and and this is no disrespect to the you know, to your guide and that story, uh, that might be true. But I, I also have to consider how many of these blocks there are and how much time it may have taken if they Evolution. each block was actually just ground by a person and each block is essentially a lifetime. Mm-hmm. That is generations and generations and generations to build each of these structures. Mm-hmm. And modern science, not to say that one's right or the other, modern science thinks that Machu Picchu was built you know, around the 400s, I believe, or something like that, between the four and 700s AD. Um, yep, that sounds about right. So, introduction: uh, Machu Picchu is a modern-day Peru. Is in modern-day Peru and is said to have built around 1450 AD. 1450. 1450. Okay. Yeah, okay. yeah uh, I knew it was. Incan Emperor. I knew it was hundreds of years, not thousands of Pacha years Kuti. old. So, but if we're talking about each stone being a lifetime, like I, I think, and this is again just a just my theory and i know that there are some other people who have similar theories i think once again these structures are much older and were found and then built upon by maybe other cultures and you can tell this by looking at some of the stonework especially in south america you can see layers where there are these big blocks that are precision cut mm-hmm. and then on top of that much smaller blocks um oh yeah the modern so, stuff again, so you can gets, see it right as here it gets newer in top yeah there. it gets worse now right. machu picchu has various levels the very top of the hill is the temple and where the inca the emperor lived himself now realize machu picchu was like it was like a like a holiday resort for the emperor okay this was not the capital of the inca empire it was its capital was in cusco uh but this is um, this is where the Inca would take his retreats. He would go here and he would have a holiday at Machu Picchu. Um, there is a temple at the top of the mountain, and that is the finest stonework in the entire complex. As you move down from the temple, you get past the royal, you know, um, the royal residence and all that. You kind of move down into the dregs and then finally into like the agricultural area and the stone becomes much less precise. Mm -hmm. It ends up looking like, uh, you know, a wall in England where they just stacked stones on top of each other, right? right? Um, But when when we speak to the precision of the Inca people, if you look at one of their cities, you know the steps that come down from their cities, they go right down the mountainside. There's, you know, each step is about 10 feet high and it's about 10 to 12 feet deep. And they, there's, you know, dozens and dozens and dozens of them that go down the mountainside. The reason those are there, <laughs> agricultural steps, Jesse. Yeah, sorry. Of grass areas, right? Yeah, like this, okay? So actually, 
Yeah, yeah. Those are the terraces. Right, the terraces. So here's what the terraces were for. The Inca people understood that the most defensible position was always at the top of the hill. But the best plants, especially medicinally, lived down in the valley in the wettest areas. So what they did was they would take, um, you know, let's say an herb that was really valuable to them medicinally, and they would pull it out of the valley and they would move it up and they would plant it on a step that was 10 feet up. At the perfect and elevation. Would, for and that they would plant. let it. Perfect uh, temperament. Right, we're right. Environment. And yep. then they would wait 10 years. And then they would build another step and move it up another step. So they were, and they'd wait ten years, to their and they'd move altitude. it up another. Step. And over a hundred years, you've moved up hmm. ten steps. That's dope. And by the How time, did they know by the time, that? by the time two <laughs> or three hundred years had gone by, you'd moved That's up rad. thirty steps, and you could now grow all of your medicinal herbs yeah, right outside your residence at the top of the mountain because they've acclimated it. That's what those steps were for. They were to move the most valuable plants from the valley floors up to their cities over oh, a long period of time. I like it. It was always an investment in the next generation. And I can't remember whether it was 10 years or five years, you know, that it took them before they acclimated it and moved it. But that's how they work. So, so when I'm going to bring us back. Talking carving about these. lifetimes, yep. carving stones, you know, back at that time, what was a lifetime? 35 years, 40 years? We... We're not exactly sure when these things were built. I could see your point of basically if I found a big structure and I was the first person I knew of to find it, just say it's mine. Or say and, it's a city of the gods. Yeah, write mm -hmm. my name on it or take credit both. for it or just say, hey, you know, moving forward, we're the ones who built this, right, guys? Like, this is our place, right? Kind of like I'm the head honcho dibs. Hey, I'm not going to tell right. you how I built this. I built this. You know, you just stay in my place. You're welcome. You know, right. uh, maybe. So, uh, we, we, or the just, gods wanted me to find this, you know, they gave it to me, you know, there's right. Destin there's and all, all that. different. Yeah. What I'm really interested in is some of the more, uh, like mechanical stuff, for instance. So these are cut marks and we don't understand this and it's deep and it's precise. And this is all over Giza. This is all over the world. It looks like somebody Giza. ran it through a bandsaw. Exactly. Yeah, that's what, and what, what's going what we on. have, are we have stones that are like cut out like this. And then stones that were abandoned in the same quarry. Like someone started to cut it and they chipped it, as you could see here. Or it cracked. Like it gets cracked a little bit and they're like, oh, that's a dead one. And then they cut a similar stone perfectly. Look at this tube drill. Uh, here's another cut mark. And these are deep, like <gasps> And now we have these tube drills too. But these tube drills, they're, they're actually, they're not just perfect holes that go through these stones. But now that we've gotten close up images of these, they have the uh, drill marks. A spiral group. Perfectly, yeah. the whole way through. Just like our modern day core drills, when we drill out ice, um, the same thing happens. That's what the ice looks like. And we get this core back. And here's the interesting part. In 1881, these were found all over the Giza Plateau. All over. These are granite. These are cores that we have today from modern science because we have high-tech machines and they got these holes all over Egypt like plumbing through granite. Um, I think a man named Flenders Petrie uh, measured these lines. I think it was Petrie that did it. Mm -hmm. And he found that, so modern day core drills, they're more or less straight lines down it from the way the drill works. And these ones, when he measured the lines, it was one continuous spiral yep. all the way down. So wow. In and out. Which is just some sort of different yep. approach to, to like a core drill. It wouldn't be exactly like ours, but it's, it's the same it's almost concept. Like a, almost like a like a tap, like you're tapping screws, you know, yeah, and you right. got to re-thread right. into what a I hole. Mean. Yeah. Right. And then we have real subtle things like this. These are these are also found uh, in ancient Egyptian like stone someone craft testing a cord drill. On like. a little tiny piece like... <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're good. On granite. Like, cool, this one's good. This is a small one that's good. All right, so I'm going to suggest something. Every... Um, <clears throat> these things are crazy. Every culture on earth that I, I have been told has a story of a great flood at one time in their legends, in their history. Um, you know, of course, many of us are familiar with the great flood of Noah in Christianity, uh, the South Americans, and they have their own story. The Native, Native Americans have their own story. The people in Asia, they have their own story, but it just seems like all cultures can agree that at one time there was a great flood. Well, 
there are a couple different theories as to how a great flood could happen. But one of them is that, um, one of them is that the outside of the earth used to be cloaked in a, uh, a, a layer of water vapor that collapsed to the earth during the time of the great flood. Now there's a whole lot of reasons as to why people believe that water vapor barrier collapsed. Uh, some people say it was, you know, geysers from the deep going into the outer atmosphere and weighing it down and it collapsed and there's all kinds of things. Um, but if that was true, then it would make sense that in being shielded from the sun's rays by a cloak of water vapor around the earth, that uh, we could potentially live longer lifetimes. And uh, this is something that Christianity itself holds, you know, the, the, the Bible itself talks about people living to 600, 800, 900, nearly a thousand years old. I think many Methuselah, old religions right? do actually, yeah. And that ends right after the story of the great flood in the Bible. So if you look at it and think, okay, the collapse of water vapor, all of a sudden their sun's rays. I mean, you know, we, we talk about in the Bible, the fact that Noah saw a rainbow and that was the promise that the earth would never be destroyed by water again. It would never be flooded again. Humanity would be spared from that. Well, how could we have a rainbow for the very first time and have that be a promise unless it was water vapor suspended getting struck by sunlight? Well, that would make a rainbow for the very first time which makes us believe that maybe every moment before that, because the earth was cloaked in a protective layer, the sun's rays couldn't penetrate. There was no such thing as a sunny day. That you couldn't a have very, a rainbow. very, very sad okay? planet. All right. right. A rainbow right. planet. Now, right. I, no, I love my sunny no, days. Thank you, dude. As soon as all the uh, water came I love my sunny days. Yeah. There was Please. a rainbow. I need cataclysm they were like, God exists. <laughs> but here's uh, the thing. Yeah, bring here's up the cataclysm. Thing. Here's the thing. You know, and I think I've suggested this to you before. What would happen if Albert Einstein yeah, like had been this. able to li live to be six or seven hundred yeah, years old? I love this. Instead of only developing his his and theories and his technology. Take a step further. Right. His kids. And now you could be a father that has, you know, six generations of of sons and daughters and That's grandkids and great grandkids and great grandkids. Oh, yeah, it is. I say all this because we don't know when the pyramids were made. We do know, however, that um, the, the, something that large would be really tough to move with a flood. <laughs> like it would probably stay. And there's a strong possibility that civilization before the great flood of the earth could have been far more advanced than we even are today due to the ex extended <laughs> lifespans. The earth may have been even more populated than it is today. So you know, when I think about who built the pyramids and could they be older and could they have had technology that we can't understand? So do we have just one possible explanation do we for have why that might be? Of when the Great Flood took place? The the Younger Dryas, if we're speaking about really bad weather conditions, the Younger Dryas is one of the worst that we had. And in Montana specifically, it's unique that we have the Missoula Dam here. Mm -hmm. Like the Flathead area used to be part of a big old ocean. I think you guys know that. Yeah. And you can look when we drive around the lake here and you can see way up at the tops of the mountains. If you just bring like your eyesight down, eventually you'll see the lines of water where it was mm -hmm. like lapping up on the mountains pretty close to the top. And as it came down over the years and uh, the flood of like Missoula is pretty powerful. The Missoula Dam basically uh, I'll bring this picture up uh, Missoula Dam flood. Um, so in our area, Flathead Lake, uh, we had this huge amount of water and it was theorized supposedly like what, from what we understand, it was, it was held back by an enormous wall of ice that was at times as it melted would be lifted and it would basically like bubble up and the amount of force that came out of there <laughs> would shoot water from here all the way to the coast. And if you look at the like uh, Randall Carlson, is it called rivulets? Um, John, you know what those things are called? Uh, flood water. He has those great photos. Yeah, um, I don't remember what the name of the the, the scablands. It's called, isn't it? It's yeah. called the scablands. So this is between us and the coast. We basically have these laser blasts, evidence of water 
This is a great example, actually. We, we have evidence when you look at the land from above that a huge force of water blasted through, ripping apart and resetting the land like it was all mm -hmm. just muck and mud. Like we have the shorelines here. We can follow that water all the way, blasting out the coast, uh, the west coast. So we have evidence in modern times of these enormous weather events. And this is just like the tail end of a big ice age that as it melted caused flooding everywhere. Well, there was actually, we're still coming off of that ice age it's as actually, far as I understand. The Younger Dryas is really something fascinating that we're still learning more about. Uh, but Randall is a guy who's been pushing these theories for a while and now actually his theories are starting to be validated by geologists. Um, who honestly, it can be a little tough for for science to accept some of these larger catastrophes. Like Randall's theory is that if if you look at history outside of Randall's theory, if you just look at what the Younger Dryas said, there's a time about thirteen and a half thousand years ago when you know we're concerned about temperatures on the Earth rising a couple degrees, right? That could like screw everything up. There's a time a couple thousand years ago where temperatures spike like twelve degrees. 12, we're worried about like one or two, and then they go into an ice age for a thousand years. And then out of the ice age, suddenly, same thing, spike breaks out of the ice age. And at this time there was enormous flooding. Um, and we haven't really known exactly what caused that 1000 year ice age for us to plunge into it or to come out of it. And Randall's theory is that it was um, basically asteroids, like little meteorites came in and rained down and uh, the first batch hit, he, he believes it was the Tarid meteor stream because there's a bunch of big chunks of rock floating in the Tarid meteor stream. We see them every year when we see the Tarid meteor shower and we're like, oh, well, it's so cool. Uh, Native Americans didn't think that was cool and ancient cultures didn't think meteor showers were cool. They thought they were terrifying. And that's I'd, because sometimes I'd, those things made it down to earth. <clears throat> I'd be out there. Destruction. Honestly, mm -hmm. and, uh, according if to, I didn't have people telling me that everything was gonna be all right, and then we weren't going to get hit, I would have been like, yo. Yeah. Well, we're like, flying through debris fields. Yeah. You know, that's what yeah. the tarred meteor stream is. It's a debris every field that we pass through shower, every year. Every time I thought we and were sometimes, something. So sometimes big chunks of it fall down. And so, like, Randall's theory is that the tarred meteor stream rained down a bunch of big chunks of rock, not just one, but a bunch of them that actually hit, like, over the, the oceans. Not the land, but actually hit in the oceans, which is why we haven't been able to identify the craters because a lot of this stuff actually hit the ocean, launched water up into the sky that froze, rained down, you know, blocked out the sun, created an ice age, threw us into an ice age and just screwed up the geology of the earth uh, to a point where we would have been in that ice age for who knows how long. I mean, we went a thousand years. It would have kept going, but that same meteor stream, according to his theory, threw more rocks down at us, and those actually broke the ice and got us out of the ice age. Hmm. So the same type of thing that put us in the ice age actually got us out a thousand years later when we passed back through the stream again and got hit with some debris. So here's here's an interesting theory that Earth and Mars every 180 years leading up to 700 BC when all of a sudden it stopped had orbits that eventually would catch up with each other and Mars would be in very close proximity to Earth. And when that happened, every 180 years, Earth would suffer a lot of cataclysmic events because of the gravitational pull of Mars. They say when Mars, uh, and actually the ancient Greeks used to say, you know, Mars was their god of war. Um, it, Mars was feared by the ancient Greeks. Well, they were saying that if, if the orbits were aligned the way they assumed they could have been previous to 700 B.C., when Mars rose over the horizon, it would be 50 times the size of a full moon. That's how big it would look, which would be terrifying if you were in ancient Greece, right? In, not in ancient so Greece now. They were talking well, <laughs> 50 yeah. times the size of a full moon. Just this is going to hit so us. So every it's 180 years, us. the orbits of Earth and it's Mars terrifying. would coincide and Mars would pass very close to Earth. And at that time... There would be chunks that would break off. They would rain down to Earth as, you know, meteors because, you know, Mars is. Um, yeah, Mars probably has its own debris right. field. And, and yeah. it would be sucked into Earth's orbit and, and vice versa. And there'd be this cataclysmic event. So 
uh, I wonder if that same, you know, we wind the clock back, um, you know, not instead of to 700 BC, we go back even further, you know, 13,000 BC or mm -hmm. I guess 11,000 BC is what you're right, talking yep, about. Yep, go right. back that far. That same, could that have led, you know, right. I don't know. Yeah, it but, could. There's, there's all kinds of things it could have been. It makes it hard to say, yeah, maybe a meteor hit it. You know, like mm -hmm. that's a really hard thing. They need to see a lot of evidence that a meteor hit to start to say, okay, maybe, you know, they need to find like uh, vitrified quartzes and things. They need to find the nano crystals that show evidence that a meteor hit, but that's what we're starting to find now in they, different places Randall around did, the earth. I believe, and I don't have this pulled up right now, talk about how there were nano diamonds found from some type of impact. Yeah, that's it. they're starting to actually as as find the evidence. Like how on Mars we found, uh, NASA found that there was a specific type of isotope that only occurs with a nuclear bomb and it's, it's in xenon, the xenon it's like xenon 129 all or over mars and they said that as far as we know there's no other way to get this isotope other than with nuclear devastation so wow. was there a nuclear and they said if it was a bomb for mars if it was a nuclear bomb it would be uh, i think they said roughly the size of like the empire state building to do that much damage and they have two localized sites um it's around Sedonia, I think it's called. And there's two like main sites that have more of a concentration of this, but it's in the soil 100% around the entire place. Mm -hmm. Sidonia, by the way, where there's supposedly uh, pictures of pyramids, satellite pictures of pyramids in the in the area there. You know, you bring up a really good point mentioning the- um, Back to the pyramids. The meteorites, let's, oh. yeah, going back to the pyramids. We were talking about how the Egyptians could have shaped these mm -hmm. stones. Well, in fact, I think we just established the fact that they had access to meteorite rock, mm -hmm. which we is harder mm, than granite. On the most scale, no. It depends, it it is to not, depends meteorite on the meteorite. Rock. Yeah, and okay. as far as we know, no. The hardest stones that we know of right now are uh, <laughs> diamond, tungsten, I believe. Uh, and, well, let me just pull up the most scale. So, most scale. Um, so, that would be diamond, yep. Do we have a, a list maybe? There we go. But these are these are stones that exist on Earth, right? Is this, this taking this, into account? Yes. Right. All okay. meteorite stones are in this list as well. Okay. Um, and I did look up actually the stone, the I don't know if this is the one you're talking about earlier, the Hypatia stone, which was discovered in December 1966, and is a slag like glass and material that was interpreted to be a form of Liberian desert glass. The rock was named after Hypatia of Alexandria, the philosopher, astronomer, mathematician, and inventor. Um, although its statue is an extraterrestrial rock, its, its status as an extraterrestrial rock is widely accepted. Hypatia is not officially classified as a true meteorite specimen by the Meteoritical Society due to its small size. But that's not what you're talking about. You were talking about some big stones. Couldn't find that. I could find meteorite like uh, metals used throughout Egypt, like in like uh, Tutankhamun's like knife. knife. He has like a meteorite. Yeah, mm -hmm. but very those special. would be very soft. Yep. That would be an iron mostly an iron meteorite so very mm -hmm. soft you know the there are meteorites that are really hard but i don't think that's what was being carved but regardless there were rocks stone there that was incredibly hard that's mm -hmm. been carved and carved you know beautifully in like the stone cuts that we were showing earlier um there's also stone i don't think it's at the great pyramid but it's at a different pyramid site there's melted stone um Jesse, can you try searching melted stone, Egypt? Sure. Uh, are you talking about the scoop marks or the melt? I'm talking about like the actual stone that looks like it's been scorched melted and melted Egypt. on the staircase. Yeah, there yes. you go. Yes, so, so we don't understand this. This is granite, once again, perfectly carved, but why would they intentionally do that and how did they melt it if that is the case? Right. It looks like it was melted, right? Yeah. It, like... Like it was turned so into lava for a moment. There is also in South America this rumor of this, like this lore that there was a there was a plant concoction that could melt stone. We or don't know what it. stone. Yeah. Soften it. We don't know what. And though. that would make sense with um, Machu Picchu. It you know, would. If they were rubbing something on it that softened the stone. Oh, yeah. There's also yeah. a bird that has been found in South America that, or I think it's a bird that uses its saliva to soften stone. Um, stone softening plants, right there with the bird in the picture, upper right. 
Yeah, I like mean, <laughs> for whatever reason, French theorists and pseudoscientists have this belief that the builders of many megalithic sites in Peru and Bolivia used a rare plant that softened stone to mold them into place. How do they make that stone, though? That's the question. It is said that there is a type of bird that lives deep in the Amazon basin that uses the plant to make its nests in stone. The plant supposedly has a medical property that melts away or makes stone malleable. The stones of Sasse Huaman look as if they were once clay molds and even show signs of vitrification on their outside layers. Hmm. There you go. You know what's really fascinating? I, I saw it. This was a long time ago. I saw a documentary with a man who, uh, what's the name of the big temple complex with the big uh, pyramid in, um, is it on the Yucatan Peninsula or in Guatemala? No. Teotihuacan. Yeah, that, what, what's that called? Tiwanaku. T t t there's Teotihuacan and there's Tiwanaku. <sighs> I don't know which one it is. I can't I remember. Know, but anyway, I think it's Tiwanaku. He found a standard unit of measure that T -I -H -U -A -N. fit. H U A N. One one answer. That's how poorly I spelled it. <laughs> one answer on Google. I spelled it so wrong. Is this what you want? You have one <laughs> idea, maybe. <laughs> That's it. He found a standard unit of measure that could be used for um, for every pyramid on Earth. He found one that worked for Central America, South America, Asia, Egypt, right, the, everywhere that we have found pyramids, that standard unit of measure could be used to measure the blocks. Right. I've heard about that. It was some sort of cubit measure that he, yeah. Yeah. He, he just basically took like a, a yardstick and then he had a little extension that he could slide on the end and that was the standard unit of measure. All right. So I'm going to say that we're going to wrap up the episode. Basically, what we wanted to introduce is the question of when they were built, uh, who built them, because I'm not sure we really know. Um, it seems like it's just too convenient that there's like a drawing of a name on one of them with no evidence. And they say, yeah, we got it done in our 20 year reign. Like me, my dad, and my grandpa. It's ours. <laughs> In our 20 what? year reign, yeah. You're like, yeah, we got 500 miles, no problem. We did it all. But no, we can't repeat the process and we can't tell you how. If we have more time, I can believe, like, maybe they were hauled into place. If we're talking, we've got, like, before the last ice age type of time. Yeah, uh, right. So and this is with this the math is a, that he worked out that doesn't add up. I know it really doesn't stick. <laughs> it doesn't. And just because some guy's name is on the side of the Great Pyramid doesn't make me think he built it. It so, seems like missing, at right. least, at least. You know, the possibility of misinformation because of time and just, you know, generations and yeah. you know, people also, could have taken it over. And what if our society goes to crap and then historians in the future look at our graffiti bridges? Are they going to think that <laughs> G-Clan built this bridge? Like, Khufu is like out of the palace <laughs> late one night getting into mischief and he's like, <laughs> Khufu on the pyramid. <laughs> this is kind yeah, of a fun one. Yeah. And then somebody came in and killed them all, so nobody got to erase That's it. a member of <laughs> the Wu Tang Clan. <laughs> uh, a very so, powerful ancient society. Mm -hmm. So, real quick before we wrap up, I just think this is a cool thing. So, this is an egg that is supposedly about 7,000 years old, according to dating, and it has an image of what looks like the pyramids, right? Yeah. And uh, the thing is that that would make this about 2,000 years older than, you know, Khufu and the building of the pyramids. Uh, so and it's not like proof pyramids. or evidence, but it's just, you know, pretty iconic image. Uh, do we know what those rings on the top are? Is there any other thing that is Egyptian about this egg? Where did, Whoever where was this egg found? pyramids onto the egg needed some Egyptian help. Uh, well, let's read the that. Nubian egg. Yeah, found in Nubia, but that's about all I know. Archaeologists are guessing the pyramids of Giza to be about 4,600 years old as carbon-14. We know this. Carbon-14 dating that dates, dates plants can't be used, can't date stone at the moment. An ostrich egg found in a tomb near Aswan shows the three pyramid structures side by side. Um, so is Aswan in That's the quarry. Egypt? Yeah. yeah, that's the quarry. Oh, yeah. That's the quarry. The quarry. That's yeah. the quarry. Oh, interesting. So it's not like it's carbon just random. dating. How does carbon dating work? They uh, date a, the the the, the, the yeah, degradation the way, or the decay. So like, um, you know how like if if there's like a, you know like Chernobyl, the radioactive spill, we can't go there for a long time because yeah. of the half life of that, of the radioactive um, elements that are in the area. So 
in the same way they measure the degradation of carbon, just like how that radioactive material breaks down over time, they could measure, you know, the rate that that radioactive material breaks down because it's constant. It's like just yeah, it's half it's just so, it's half. so, so does it's the it same. depend on the material they can. Yeah, so carbon, with carbon, they, they can know it. exactly how it ages. So they can basically just double it back in time or divide it. You know what I'm saying? But it has to yeah. be carbon based life form. So it has to be like an ostrich egg, something like that was organic. It yeah. was you know, you know or a, yeah. a fireplace so or something like that, bone or whatever. Yeah. Exactly. But we can't ash, do it with stone. You know, and when we like date the any material we find like around the site or even between cracks in the rock, that doesn't mean that it was there at the time that it was constructed. Right. Yeah, it just means yeah. somebody built a fire there or somebody was hanging out there. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A couple other small things. This Ramsey head, Ramsey head the second. So this thing is gigantic and it's perfect. It's like, symmetrical, it, perfectly symmetrical. As When modern engineers look at this, they consistently say it must be like laser, like because everything is too perfect on both sides. So to rub or chip or, you know, cut, um, they they just don't understand. It would be hard for us to do even today. Uh, finally, this is the abandoned obelisk. So this obelisk is still attached to the bedrock, but it's perfectly cut out on all sides until it cracked. And then they just decided they weren't gonna take it out. And now underneath these obelisks in this same quarry, you see these scoop marks. So it's like very sharp precision edges, 90 degree angles, and then almost like soft marks behind them. Hmm. Um, and that weighed 1,168 tons. So they were moving these obelisks around. The obelisks are even bigger than the megalithic blocks. It seems like there was some advanced machining, especially when you get into some of the core drills. So, yeah, the, the cut marks that we were looking at earlier. I know like Aswan Quarry has a lot of cut marks and things like that. So like this is the quarry where where the obelisk is and where they cut a lot of these stones, and uh, just you know, Mott, to get the theory out of right now of what how science thinks these things were cut, they think they basically had like stone or copper saws and they were rubbing sand onto the stone and then rubbing it with the saw. So like letting the sand do the work to cut through the stone. Mm -hmm. And that does work, but it's incredibly slow work. It's like the granite on granite type of thing. Mm. It just would take absolutely forever and there would be no exactness to it. You wouldn't be cutting perfectly straight edges or anything like that. I should say that I wanted to bring up some of those granite channels, you know, that are underneath the floors, mm -hmm. not just the tube drills, but they found these they, they look basically like gutters, but they're through granite block and they find them underneath the floors. Mm -hmm. um, and without going too deep and opening up a whole other conversation, uh, one of the, who was that guy? The chem guy, Egypt chem on that channel that we just watched with that girl, the land of chem. Mm -hmm. So this guy, the land of chem just gave an interview and he talked about in depth about how, and maybe we'll, maybe next show we'll, we'll start there. Um, that in addition to not being sure if there was machinery used at some of these sites, because it looks like it would be modern machinery techniques that we would use today, um, he suggests that perhaps the pyramids themselves were actually a machine. And that's why they were precision cut. We find these chambers that are very sophisticated in the, the, the center of the pyramid, the blocks were shaped in such a way that these shafts and these angles, uh, his theory that he's suggesting is that they actually look like they were designed to be used like a factory would be used. And mm -hmm. he goes on to say specifically uh, ammonia production, <clears throat> uh, basically fuel, and then channeling that through the floor, like so that people could have light through fire and ammonia doesn't cause smoke and we don't have smoke in these ancient megalithic buildings. Like natural gas, you know? Yeah. I haven't heard that, that's fascinating. Yeah. All right, I would like to disclaim the fact that uh, just about everything I said could be absolute crap, um, you know? Just All wanna say I am, I am not here. I'm not an expert. I am here to just participate in the conversation, but yeah, um, absolutely, bro. I would not take anything I said to the bank at None all. None of us are yeah. experts. None yeah. of us are experts. We're just, <laughs> this stuff's fascinating. Yeah. It is most, fascinating. It mostly gets talked about by experts. So yeah. we just wanted to kind of jump in and 
and start to sift through it because yeah. there's so much cool stuff here that there is. Oh, I don't. Know. It's all I've always been fascinated. Yeah, the only thing I know is I don't know, but I yeah. am fascinated yeah. too, man. Yeah, yeah. that is like, what I'm positive on. Bro. Oh, that's terrifying. That's scarier or as scary as space. Maybe even scary if it's like right underneath us. Like oh, we know the ocean bed. will kill us. Yeah. Yeah. Seriously. Mm -hmm. So we know the ocean will kill us. Space might not. Anyway, guys, time. We're gonna wrap there. Thanks for hanging with us. Let us know if you enjoyed this. We'll continue the conversation, pick up videos, and keep uploading them your way. And until next time, uh, appreciate all the support, and we'll see you. Yeah, thanks, guys. I don't really feel like calling it Meta Bros because it's more of like a family situation. Yeah, Meta Fam. We'll have to think Meta of a fam. name for it. <laughs> Meta Fam. Meta Fams with a Z. Later, guys. Mm -hmm.